So sometimes we get questions from people. We'll see. All right. <laughs> um, Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Perception and Action Journal Club. Um, it's my pleasure today to be joined by Mike and Casey, who are going to talk to tell us about this new um, product they're developing and using uh, called ProPlay AI, right? It's a um, tool for doing biomechanics assessment and analysis um, with a particular focus on baseball. Right now, baseball pitching, I think, but maybe you, know, you could talk about some other things. So before we get rolling on that, I thought I, I'd let you guys introduce yourselves. So I'll go down. Casey, If you, I'll let you go first for introduction. Sounds good. Uh, my name is Casey Mulholland. Um, my background is actually from the playing side of things. Um, jumped into the coaching side of the game in 2016. I uh, got released by the Los Angeles Dodgers at the time due to ro rotator cuff surgery. Um, my background I was supposed to be actually be a first round draft pick out of high school. I uh, missed it by about 60 days of Tommy John surgery. And, uh, that sent me on this catalyst of trying to figure out, uh, you know, what can I do to stay healthy? Um, and led me to a bunch of great places, met a bunch of great people. And, uh, when I got done with my playing career, quickly realized my network, um, and decided that, uh, I could do, uh, some work to help guys not go through what I went through. So, uh, we are here now with kinetic pro. Cool. And Mike. Yeah, so um, I'm Mike Son. I'm the uh, VP of Innovations and Research with ProPlay AI. Um, my background's actually in ergonomics um, and uh, occupational biomechanics. I uh, did my PhD at McMaster University up here in, uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, uh, and, uh, and found my way into baseball probably about, uh, about five years ago. Um, kind of when I started applying some of the ergo stuff around muscle fatigue and muscle fatigue accumulation into the pitch clock world. So thanks for, for having me on, Rob. Yes, I know your um, fatigue units are, your FUs are. <laughs> <laughs> I've read a few things about those. So, well, that's one of the best <laughs> names. Um, that, so, was yeah. the, that was the fun part of not having to get it peer reviewed. <laughs> you can just come up with whatever name you want. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll start and get start make maybe tell us about so this is a, a phone based product for doing um, biomechanics and maybe kind of the emphasis I'm you know I'm not a, totally up on the biomechanics but I think like most people I, I, I kind of know there's two extremes there's the labs where you have a, a bio emotion tracking system that costs a fortune and takes forever to put trackers on and then the other end, you have people using still images <laughs> and trying to draw little angles on things. Yeah. So, uh, which has its own. So, where kind of what was the impetus for this, and how did you get started? Yeah, um, yeah. So, I'll dive a little bit into the ergo space to kind of give you some some context on Perfect. on all yeah. this. Um, so, when we started uh, writing the papers on uh, on doing our uh, fatigue units or looking at um, the effect of pitch clocks, it was applying an ergonomics based model um, to the baseball space, and I started looking at it from the perspective of ergonomics. In ergonomics, when we're talking about injury, we look at three things and the interaction of those three things. And it's force, it's posture, and it's repetition. And when we were looking at baseball pitching, the force side is pretty straightforward. It's you know somewhat related to effort and velocity. Mm -hmm. um, the repetition side is trying to better understand workload, which we know is a lot more than just pitch counts or innings pitched. And that's kind of where fatigue units came from. But then the final one was the mechanics side of things and understanding a pitcher's mechanics or their postures as they threw and how that related to injury. And uh, a few years ago, um, we had a, a master's student at Brock University uh, study with Dr. Mike Holmes and I named uh, Richard Burfer. And Richard, uh, his master's thesis was to basically try and apply um, some of the same uh, methods we've used in ergonomics, where we look at a still frame at a still position in time. So right at foot strike, we're just looking at image at foot strike and trying to see how accurate people were in assessing that compared to motion capture. And we had a bunch of scouts and coaches do that evaluation. Mm -hmm. And that was going to kind of be, okay, we can maybe use this. And it turned out, you know, they were right maybe 50% of the time, not even 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. Now, around that same time, um, we started using some of this markerless motion capture to start measuring job demands in uh, and postural demands in the workplace, primarily assembly line type work. 
And I remember one day just kind of, you know, I think hanging out probably before softball or something, filmed a friend throwing and said, hey, you know, this might work from this. And we kind of just took off from there and said, you know, what can we get? How accurate can we be from cell phone video compared to a motion capture lab? And, you know, our initial results are we're about we're about three quarters to 85 percent as accurate as a motion capture lab. Um, and, you know, there's some metrics that perform better than others, but we're getting a lot better than we had when it's somebody's just using a still image or kind of using their subjective approach. OK, yeah. And I know some you, I think you've talked about some of the limitations of using uh, those other approaches. I know one of the big ones people talk about it for people, the parallax issue, right? When Absolutely. Just, if you're if you're side on and versus an angle the same joint mm -hmm. angle is going to be different <laughs> yeah. right depending on so it's, you you without knowing that um yeah so there's some big issues that that that's really really interesting and casey where did you come into this you you mentioned you had an injury as your, yourself and sought to try to understand it better how did you kind of connect with mike and your your approach to this yeah, so um, Ben Hansen actually with Modus Global connected us. Um, and so I saw Mike online on Twitter and and again, just the network, right? Baseball is a tight knit community. And um, I was always seeking new answers. I actually stumbled upon uh, Mike's FUs, which became obviously very popular. Um, and uh, so he and I reached out actually before the winter meetings this past year. And um, and we just got in touch over, over Twitter, started talking uh, at the winter meetings. We kind of hit it off and discussed what workload management was, how we were using it in facilities. So one of the big things that we've done over the last year and a half is really took the uh, motor global uh, product and built out going progressions based around um, our overall uh, workload um, for guys in the off season. So especially with our professional athletes, um, we were able to uh, develop systems based around one day workload uh, values and then calculate out for them what they should do in season or how they should be prepared for season. Uh, it took a lot of makes work um, and actually, you know, built a lot of our programming based around that. So uh, Mike kind of hit it off. Uh, Mike and I kind of hit it off in that space, talking about workload management and, and how to grow it uh, within the game. So mm -hmm. to be clear, it was workload management and bourbon. Those were the two <laughs> that, that relationship to really flourish. <laughs> that that'll help it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the modus you're talking about, you are you talking about the sleeve, the modus sleeve? Yes. And what what is that that measures for? What does that measure? It measures uh, uh, valgus torque. So on the elbow, okay. it's yep. So um, every throw, we're calculating valgus torque on the elbow, and we're able to actually develop. So what I did was I built a program based around uh, one day workloads with that. So we can plan whether you're doing plyo care throws or long toss throws. Each and every throw that a guy performs, whether it be in facility with us or outside of it, uh, we're able to track that and then basically plan out what's ahead off of what they've done in the past to avoid fatigue. Okay. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep simplifying this for me. <laughs> so Absolutely. it's rotate so that's like rotational force around your elbow joint, right? How much force you're putting on your yep. poor little <laughs> UCL uh, as a pitcher. Um so are you looking for in that are you looking for kind of the amount of time they're above a certain range or just kind of like the you are you kind of adding up the total force or, or how yes. you kind of you, yeah. So one day workloads take into account uh, volume and intensity. So okay. when we are looking at an athlete, we want to be able to say, okay, early in the off season, we want a lot more volume. Uh, we don't want a lot of intensity. Mm -hmm. So we can plan for that through our one day workloads. As our fitness level increases, our chronic workload increases, then we can start to increase intensity like at a specific rate. I use about 10% to 15% with our guys through the course of the off season. And then we deliver them in season at a specific fitness level that meets their requirements, whether they are a reliever or a starter. Um, we help guys understand where they need to be. Okay. And Mike, so with the bio is the biomechanics connection trying to identify the, the body positions that how they relate to force and kind of kind of, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think at its core, that's you know, we're mm -hmm. trying to understand what motion characteristics are related to elevated force levels on okay. the elbow or you know on the shoulder. Um, but it goes beyond, you know, just understanding it from an injury perspective as well. Like there are characteristics of movement and timing of different segments of the body moving through space that are related to uh, throwing harder, um, throwing mm -hmm. more strikes, um, being in more command. So I think that's really where, um, you know, we're trying to present pitch AI and, and the pro play as a company is to understand injury, but also to understand the things that go into performance. 
Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. And it's when I try to, a lot of times something that's going to cause injury is also likely breaking the kinetic chain, yes. <laughs> which is going to affect velocity or something along the line. Right. So yeah. they, they work hand in hand. Yeah. I think that that's a great point. And so your, your initial kind of approach with, with this, are you just, you're collecting data from a lot of different pictures at different levels and kind of establishing a database? Is that kind of where you're starting with this? Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, before <laughs> everything kind of went crazy, we were we were in Phoenix. Um, mm -hmm. We won't talk about the golf game Casey and I had <laughs> when we were in Phoenix. That never actually happened. Um, but the goal there was to understand two things. One, you know, how do high level throwers move? And mm -hmm. To do that, it was really just a matter of capturing a bunch of in-game and, and bullpen data whenever whenever we could. And the second thing was, you know, kind of related to a, a blog post I wrote a little while ago, was to understand how we could break pitch AI, um, mm -hmm. to understand when its limitations would really start to kick in and, and to come up with best practice for capturing video. Because as much as, you know, we're saying it's it's 75 to 85% as accurate as a motion capture lab, that comes with caveats. We do require open side video and there is some flexibility in there, but it was really to understand, you know, what are best practices for capturing that type of video so that we can use it for biomechanical analysis. Yeah, yeah, I was I watched your your um, video on that and then it's really impressive. I, I like you said there's best practices, but it's pretty you can kind of just walk into an open practice right? even when there's multiple you you mentioned there's issues with multiple people around, but it's still yeah can work depending on, uh, you know, so there's the best way to do it, but it, still you don't need this perfect sterile lab. You can do no. it in a game, you can do it on the mound and yeah, on the field at night, even it was a bit tricky. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah and that, that was more, that was more yeah. on the operator. Uh, I needed yeah. to adjust that ISO setting a little bit better, but uh, once I got that, we were, we were looking pretty good. Yeah, and so Casey, what have you been using it uh, with so far? Um, yeah, so our athletes, we typically have somewhere in the ballpark of 20 to 50 athletes that come to our facility on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, the issue with a uh, motion capture lab, as we've talked about before, is number one, the, the price barrier is, you know, for facilities like mine, um, where, you know, I had a minor league salary, uh, it, it wasn't great. You know, I came out of it and just looking to do good and trying to help guys out, um, you know, our business has grown, but we're still not at a point where we could afford $300,000 uh, biomechanics lab. Um, so the ability for pitch AI to step in as, as a, you know, open side camera that you already own that sits in your pocket on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, that ability to capture guys through that, it helps the, the owner number one, but number two, uh, the rate of feedback for our athletes helps the athlete. Um, and as you know, the app starts to get moving, um, and, and it, it starts to function uh, more fully in its ability to, you know, actually spit out uh, pitch to pitch reports our guys will be able to use that objective feedback to make adjustments and to determine, did I get here or did I not get here? Much like you see uh, other technologies in the game today, looking at pitch design or um, you know other functionalities, guys can utilize that and lean on that data to determine, was this a good breaking ball or not? Was, was this a good pitch in terms of mechanics or not? Um, and I think that's where Mike and I really talked. Um, we've done a, a little bit of a research project. We're starting to kind of wade through the data now, um, getting 20 athletes so far through our facility um, collecting five pitches each and we're starting to determine, okay, this is what we're starting to see through our guys. We have guys that I think there's three guys on that data set that throw a hundred and we've got a couple of guys that are 13 years old. So uh, you have a wide cool. range. We're starting to see a much, much broader picture of what mechanics truly are. So, so you, are you trying to relate kind of the mechanics, you know, a joint angle, you know, all the things you can measure to pitch outcomes, you know, this, this tends to make for a higher velo velocity, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we want to see what yeah. performance looks like. We know that yeah. there's a barrier to get to college. If a division one coach comes to a game and watches an athlete, the first thing he's going to look at is he's going to pull his radar gun out and say, do you throw, you know, 85 plus or not? And yeah. if you don't, then he's going to put the radar gun away and probably walk away. So. Yeah. And that, yeah, that, that's interesting to pitch. So I, I think people for the, that don't know the kind of pitch design you're referring to is, you know, you get a pitcher to let move your finger slightly this way. Mm -hmm. So you're there and then see what it does. We can measure the break and everything on the ball now. So you're doing the kind of the same things with in terms of biomechanics, you know, try whatever, bending your arm more, striding longer, and you can actually collect that data and show them. And do you actually show them the, the, I think you have kind of stick figure feedback, right, Mike? Um, yeah. Is that what you're using? Mm -hmm. Stick figures. There's, there's lots of graphs and, um, mm. 
you know, just those charts and, and Casey's had a lot of success with communicating, you know, here's your leg angle and here's your shoulder and here's how they, they interact in time, um, which was something that, you know, I'm, we're, we're constantly trying to make it so that we can make biomechanics more accessible. It is very heavily driven by complex measures and, and Casey's done a really good job of communicating with the athletes. And I think once you hit that kind of threshold with the athletes where they're understanding what you're saying, and you can communicate it through numbers, you know, you, it really opens up a whole nother playing field. And, and Casey's done a great job with that. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear you know, how you're doing, because I know, uh, I think there are a few years ago, I remember an ASMI study where they brought in a bunch of people and did biomechanical analyses and kind of made technical recommendations for changes. And then they measured to what extent people could implement these changes and it was not very good sure. <laughs> but i don't i think the problem is the measurement and the person in trying to do the correction is not connected like in your case yeah so absolutely. It's, yeah so do you it's, want to, yeah go ahead it's, so when i think that we have to look at uh the industry's change like this it, it's you know we're getting all this objective data and a lot of people are asking the question of what do we do with it um and there's so many different tools we have a a six sensor uh, program from Modus that measures range of motion. So we do an assessment with a guy and determine internal external rotation of the shoulders and hips. And a kid looks at that and goes, it, it means nothing to me. What does that mean to me? But if I can connect his biomechanics report and say, hey, listen, we're seeing that your hip internal rotation is affecting your pelvis rotation, which is an effect, in effect of affecting the kinetic chain, they get a, a basic understanding of that they understand at the end of it that the more uh, corrective work I do or the more mobility work I do in this case, the better off I'm gonna be. We can gamify the system for them at that point, create a leaderboard, say, hey, listen, this guy's really working hard. We can value um, certain types of training for that athlete. And within a facility setting, we can incentivize that athlete to say, hey, listen, next time you test, we wanna see these numbers go up or we wanna get into this range. Um, mm -hmm. athletes do a really good job. They are very competitive. So they do a really good job when you give them incentives, they'll go mm -hmm. after it. We just have to hold it to a, a standard where it means something to them. We have to talk to them in, a, in their terms and mm -hmm. then get it to mean something to them to make, you know, affect change. Yeah. I guess uh, I maybe could direct this to you first, Mike, too. How much, how much is this individual, right? I don't know if you've collected enough data. Is, is it variable? Like the relationship between rotation and force, you know, is not the same, not, so we're not, everyone has the same exact pitching, pitching motion, right? It has to be kind of individual. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where I was taking a lot of exception to kind of how the industry was positioning a lot of biomechanics. And, you know, this isn't the entire industry, but very specific individuals who I felt were acting in bad faith by saying, there is this one specific movement pattern that if you do this, you're going to hurt your elbow. When, you know, from a pure biomechanics and anatomy standpoint, we know how much variability there is on like line of action from, you know, origin and insertions, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's remarkable to understand how much variability is in the human body um, from mm -hmm. person to person. So to say there's one sort of mechanical uh, set that is gonna keep you from getting hurt, gonna keep you from, um, you know, throwing hard, it's absolutely crazy to think that. And I think one of the, the use cases that we've had for using pitch AI is to validate what you are coaching. You know, if you're mm -hmm. using a cue constantly to try and get more external rotation or to work on lead leg blocking, you know, mm -hmm. film the person, introduce the cue, film them again and see if it actually made a difference. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, rely on rely on the objective data that you can get out of this type of a process. And th whether that's, you know, pro play or pitch AI or it's a motion capture lab or, you know, you're working with a, some sort of a video analysis, um, you know, you can't take a one size fits all approach to understanding mechanics. And, you know, not to, to go too far off on a tangent, but Casey has a great story about one of his current athletes right now that if you were to look at this individual's mechanics, you'd say there's three big things that they're doing wrong. But then you look at the radar gun and it's 99, <laughs> right? So it's tough yeah. to say that there's a lot happening that's wrong. Yeah. So yeah, what 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 about you, Casey? What's your with kind of the individual differences and things you're seeing? 
Yeah, it's it's the same. I mean, um, you know, I think one of the things I took exception to when I was younger was everybody kept telling me that if I don't change my mechanics, um, that I'm I'm gonna have Tommy John surgery. And and it I ended up having Tommy John surgery. But if you put, you know, 20 16 year olds that were throwing 90 plus miles per hour in a room and you told them all they're gonna have Tommy John surgery, you'd probably be more than half right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, especially back then when we didn't understand or, or really, uh, you know, quantify a single throw. Uh, we just looked at pitch counts and, and we know that pitch counts then in and of themselves are, are, you know, I don't want to say worthless, but, uh, they're, they're not good. Um, so, uh, I think from a pitch AI standpoint, from a biomechanics standpoint, you know, we start to look at guys and, um, a lot of the, the Twitter crowd. So you look online and you'll see a lot of information coming off of Twitter. That's saying, if you don't do these things, the same thing I was being told when I was younger, if you don't do these things, you're going to get hurt. And it's just not not the case. You can you know pull out you know person after person after person that are elite level throwers. Um, and you know if we're evaluating their career, their future uh, based upon specific movements that they're either getting into or not getting into, uh, I think we're missing the boat big time. So it's kind of really excited to see what Mike and and uh, you know the pro play stuff is coming out with. I think it's going to be. Um, somewhere that in the future we can shift the narrative a little bit and start to kind of poke some holes in this and look at, you know, like you're saying, more individuality of, the, of each athlete as they walk through, find out what works and what doesn't work and continue to build on it. Yeah, no, those are great points. I know anyone that kind of follows baseball, you know, every time there's a video of a, some young pitcher throwing hard, there's 10 posts about, oh, he's going to blow out his elbow, right? Because <laughs> he's doing the, but um, it, this certainly reminds an article I just did yesterday on one of these, um, you know, we have this kind of egotistical assumption that we know more than your central nervous system does about how you should be moving, right? You kind of know something, um, yeah. figured out something. So, but I guess another thing I could say, uh, connecting it, Casey, maybe you, we talked about, Mike talked about, you know, cueing, seeing if the person changes the movement. And then I think a lot of people, what people miss sometimes is then actually, does it matter for performance, right? Uh, to actually measure, maybe we get them to do the more leg blocking or whatever but it doesn't change velocity at all you know because a lot of it forget we think it will matter but we still need to make that connection um so you are you connecting the the, the performance measures as well yeah yeah, ab yeah. absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool yeah yeah because i think that sometimes we don't we have these assumptions and so is you know so the, uh, that's good so the idea here is not to kind of identify key uh overall you know things that everyone has to have to, to be injury to have effective problems. Is it more, is this approaching more individualized optimization kind of? Would you describe? Uh, I would yeah. say yes. Yeah, I would say yes. And um, you know, one of the, one of the features that we built into the commercial version of the app that's going to come out in, uh, in July is just the ability to take those two stick figures and compare against yourself very, very quickly. Um, and, and going back to some of the, the research that we've done here um, with uh, Dr. Holmes and, and Ryan Bench and Richard Burfer, uh, we put together a systematic review on kinematics as they pertain to fatigue during pitching. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really going to be where one of the most uh, exciting utilizations of the tool is, is an understanding how does somebody change throughout a game? You know, how are your mechanics changing? Are you moving away from, you know, that lead leg blocking? Or are you, you know, not uh, optimizing your kinetic chain quite as much as, as you were when you were fresh? And, you know, maybe that is theoretically putting more stress on the arm. We can start getting at those individualized changes, I think, as somebody performs. And I think that's really where the exciting stuff is, right? Is you're going to see some people who maybe their velocity goes down, but they keep their mechanics constant. And that person may not be at risk of injury. But from our, our review paper, what we found is that changes in kinematics typically happen before we see a uh, change in their performance. And they are now transferring themselves into a different sort of movement pattern where they're putting more stress on their elbow or on their shoulder so that they can maintain performance. So if you're just looking at that one measure, um, chances are you're not getting the full story about how somebody's you know risk of injury is changing, and I think the same thing happens you know with somebody in Casey's facility there, you know have somebody come in there and throw, and and maybe one week they're you know hitting 95, the next week they're hitting 93, and they're reporting a lot of arm pain. Um, maybe that's because they've tried something different, or they're compensating because of another injury. Um, all like kind of things that I think 
lead us to using this in an individualized sense to try and really better understand things. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. I don't know if you have enough data to to make an inference about this, but kind of Casey, what is there kind of what's the kind of timeline between pain, uh, performance, and and actually kinematics? Like, so do you kinematics start to change? I think way before pain. Pain's really a bad sig bad yes. <laughs> signal, isn't it? Happens way too late <laughs> yeah. um, for most things. Um, like think of putting your hand on a stove, right? It's sure. way too late to prevent damage and things. But <laughs> do you, so have you kind of got experience? Can you pick up these kind of early signs before? Uh, so the thing yeah. that I've been really interested in, um, the Moda C does a great job of providing one day workload values, but it combines both volume and intensity. So mm -hmm. one of the issues that we've seen mm -hmm. is guys can be the, the Moda C uses the AC ratio. Um, the AC ratio is a, a, a metric that we look at and, and give us a good general idea from a global standpoint, right? So if I took a whole team of athletes, I could use the AC ratio and its parameters to kind of govern, um, you know, universalized programming for those guys. Um, it gets very individual in terms of how we make those programs. But the one thing that it really lacks is the specificity of how quickly should we progress intensity? Um, you know, if a guy is throwing at 100%, do I throw 10 throws with him today at 100% or do I throw 20 throws today with him at 100%? We really, um, you know, we take a guess and I've, I've lowered our rates on that. But I think it would be interesting to see, and this is something that, you know, down the road, again, just having this tool, being able to use this on a day-to-day -day basis, um, watching guys as we uh, introduce that intensity, that high intensity throwing off the mound, watch how their body reacts to that. Um, if we're seeing substantial differences in terms of like slot or if we're seeing substantial difference in terms of like rotation from even their catch play to the mound. Uh, you know, we have the ability to capture those throws anywhere, anytime now. And that's a huge, that's a powerful space that nobody's really explored. So, yeah, no, I think it's, it's just, you know, a more informed decision, right. Instead of the old, Hundred pitches because it's a nice round <laughs> number, right? Yeah. Uh, let's let's actually have some information to make a decision about when when's enough. And yeah, that that's really interesting. Um, you know, so and so you've been focused on pitching mostly, Mike. Is there is there a tend to look at other kind of you know hitting and then other sports as well? Yeah, ab absolutely, yeah. right. And um, I think what makes the most sense is the approach we're taking, which is you know capture motion capture data capture markerless motion capture data, um, come up with some corrective networks, um, that type of thing. I think that approach is scalable into uh, other sports and other motions. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I, I kind of learned while we were in Phoenix is that it will pick up a hitter's swing. Um, mm -hmm. The issue there is, you know, we, we want to have some markered motion capture data to see how accurate it is. And, you know, we're, we were, we were starting to do that. Um, things got shut down, but now we're, you know, working with some partners to, to collect some of those data now and we'll have hitting very shortly. And then really a matter of just, you know, what other sports do you want to apply this to? Um, we do have some of it already in the ergonomic space. Um, you know, golfing is something that makes uh, total sense. Um, but then I, th I think there's a, there's a lot of other um, types of motion and, and types of activities that you can apply this type of thing to that uh, it all makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And for um, for this product, are you doing so right? I, so it's capture. You can capture the video on your phone. Just yeah, it's pretty sounds pretty simple. I, really simple, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, could even, I don't know anything about my the options on my phone, and I could probably figure. Out. But then it gets sent. You're doing the uh, you're doing the analysis kind of offline. It's not kind of an automated. Uh, right now, analysis. that's the yeah. case. Yeah. yeah. So right now, the way that it's worked is is Casey uh, captures it just in the slow motion setting on his iPhone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, he uploads those to a Google Drive, and then we analyze them, um, and then return, you know, CSV files and, and animations. Uh, but that's all being automated right now, and that'll work through APIs in the future. So, um, you know, we're positioning this as a a mobile app so that we can, you know, get biomechanics into anyone's hands. But the reality is, through those APIs, it doesn't matter if it's cell phone video or if it's one of those. You know, like the camera I was using in Phoenix, the Sony RX100 uh, Mark VI, uh, mm -hmm. or even something like an Edutronic or something like that. Like, it really just matters that you've got the video and it's from a relatively open side angle and and we can return those data to you. Oh, that's cool. A um, couple of questions I have that are kind of related to my pet ideas, Casey, yeah. maybe, is have you got an idea from this about how the variability of delivery within the same 
pitcher, same pitch. Like repeat of, how important is repeatability versus are you seeing some changes from pitch to pitch uh, on some of these measures? Yeah, from from my end of it, um, you know, we, I can tell you this, from looking at ball flight data uh, alone, right, before mm -hmm. we even jumped into the, the biomechanics space and, and started to work with our guys more consistent with the biomechanics space, we were seeing, you see variability of a pitch to pitch, almost every pitch. And and then you start to see it from a biomechanics space and you realize just how drastic the changes are uh, pitch to pitch on most guys. Um, now, timing and sequence is, is not necessarily, um, you know, I like to say drastic. You graph it, it looks drastic, but you know we realize how small of a time frame that really is. And the body is repeating itself. So um, I think it it's, it would surprise most coaches to know that the arm slot changes. You know, a uh, specific amount of of degrees. You know, athlete to athlete. Some guys are better. Some guys are worse. I think it would surprise some coaches to know how much fatigue really plays factor into the uh, changing of those mechanics. Uh, but I think that's something that you know as this starts to come out. Uh, this becomes more accessible. People are really going to have to rethink, man, this whole discussion of, you know, repeatability of change up to fastball and slot or repeatability of curveball to fastball and slot is much, much different than we thought it was. And, you know, we have to take into effect the, uh, you know, rotational speed of the arm, take into effect that if the guy's still 99 miles an hour, you know, really no matter where the curveball is coming out of at that point, it's, <laughs> it's substantially a different pitch and very hard to hit. So mm -hmm. um, I think we start to change our, at least our definitions of these things, um, you know, what is repeatability? I think that's going to completely change in terms of how we approach the definition of it. Uh, but I think there is still repeatability. Just it's how we quantify it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mike, did you have some? Oh, I, this has yeah. like been like a pet project that I've been so excited about for some time because, you know, I just, I, I love the study of variability. Um, mm -hmm. And I, rem I recall very early on getting involved in some of the baseball discussions and people were talking about, you know, it's good to have variability in your release point. And I was kind of thinking like, I don't know if that's necessarily true. There's going to be some variability, but I think a lot of variability in release points going to be difficult to replicate. But now that we're getting kind of this full signal data on the kinematics, we can start looking at that variability that occurs before release point. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it gets very, very exciting, both from a fatigue perspective, because if you're able to adapt kind of slightly minuscule different movement patterns but still produce the same end result with a consistent release point you know you're technically almost giving some different muscle groups different uh activity levels at times right and i think if we you know i'm i'm not a motor control guy but if we kind of look at, at uh, so don't don't start quizzing me out too much on, but if we start looking at things like the uncontrolled manifold hypothesis right like there's variability that happens and there's good and there's bad and I think we can start to understand the good and the bad types of variability that happen during pitching when we can get a lot of data on, on how somebody's moving and you know how they move from one pitch to the next. And one of the things that we were super excited about at Brock University was that we, we were able to get a grant um, for the Canada Summer Games. Whether or not they happen still <laughs> uh, to be determined, but we can capture all the video in game um, during these games. and. Uh, you know, we can start to get to the, the root of some of these things and, you know, do kind of full biomechanics assessments for every pitch thrown in that game that, you know, that's exciting to think about. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. If you're, if you're a variability lover, <laughs> we need to have a beer or a bourbon or whatever. <laughs> that's one of my favorite subjects too. I've been doing the same kind of angle and hitting and yeah. you know, kind of seeing the same things. Um, the phrase we use sometimes in motor learning is repetition without repetition. So yes. we're creating the same release point, similar outcome, but not exactly the same way. <laughs> but you're moving differently to get there. And uh, but I really like I haven't really I've I've speculated about this a few times. Is the injury angle. Of, yeah. So we talk about rep doing things differently each throw is necessary because of just the way the body is. It, you, mm -hmm. But but the idea that that might actually be beneficial in terms of reducing injury. I think it's a really neat idea that no one's really explored. I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I know like um, to, to some extent here, uh, mm -hmm. like Stephen Oster, Dr. Stephen Oster, he works for Cleveland now and mm -hmm. 
he's um, he was the former uh, performance director for a baseball development group, and he was big into understanding variability, and and he, and he still is. He's just doing it behind the iron curtain of professional <laughs> baseball now. Yeah. Um, so, but understanding variability from that perspective, right? This comes back to what we know about variability within um, the ergonomic space. Uh, those individuals who have more task variability reduce their muscle fatigue, and sometimes they uh, they they reduce their injury rates, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but the ability to use different muscle groups, the ability to recruit different muscle groups, and to change your arm action and to vary the amount of torque that's placed on certain parts of the body, I think that's absolutely instrumental to to keeping people healthy. And I think it is one of the things that we miss from, you know, all of our current analyses because we haven't been able to really capture it. Mm -hmm. And the, the other one I was talking about kind of related, you know, I, I call it um, kind of functional variability is, mm -hmm. you know, how, how the different parts of the delivery work together, right? So I don't know if you, if you'd be able to capture that in your, so if I'm slightly early on whatever pa early part of a pitching delivery, how can I compensate for it later on by changing my shoulder rotation? Or, do, Casey, do you have any, you know? Like adjust, can you can you assess that or in your ideas on that? <laughs> I, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, in the baseball space, we talk about drills all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody communicates and says we want to use constraint drills or, you know, block care throws. I think a lot more and something that's not said enough is that it really comes down to what happens in the weight room. It's probably more effective to what actually occurs on the mound. Um, you know, when we talk about mobility and stability. Uh, I'm not going to be able to develop that having a kid throw a, a eight ounce or five ounce plyo care ball into a wall most days. Um, you know, we talk about rotation and, and the importance of the different segments, understanding, controlling different segments. Um, you know, we, we try to put it into the, our strength coach's hands and, and allow him to do his job and teaching the foundation there and then building it up onto the mound. So when we start to talk about the different segments and how they work together and the timing, it's completely individual and unique to everybody. And that's something Mike and I have really talked about is, is how do we quantify this? How do we say what is right versus what is wrong? Um, you know, I'm not sure I have an answer on that yet, but I do know, you know, the general principles that we've, we've walked through and seen in the past and what we've studied, but um, you know, we're going to, we're going to work toward those because we think they, some of them might be right, but we're going to test the whole way through and, and continue to try to make determinations as to what is best practice here. Um, and, and the more and more we get deeper into it, the more and more I'm finding, my role as a pitching coach is, is much less in that space. It's more on the educational space and mm -hmm. teaching pitching, not necessarily teaching moving. So, yeah. yeah. And so I guess, uh, so how, with that is, is how do you find there's a big individual difference in how much players want information and how they want it? But this is something I've been kind of thinking about for a long time. You know, we have all this data now. I've seen some teams that do ridiculous. <laughs> they just give players a huge printout with everything on it. I, I couldn't <laughs> understand it. But so do you find some players just want a really simple cue versus seeing the whole biomechanics output? I have a theory on the gold standard of this. Um, <laughs> okay. and, and walk with me for a second. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> But uh, so we've looked at different technologies that come out now over the past couple of years and, and we'll use Fitbit as the example, right? Mm -hmm. So Fitbit came out and, and I'll use my mother for an example. She got a Fitbit for Christmas and mm -hmm. it became a family thing as who could get the most steps in the day. And she was always proud. She'd come home and tell me, I got more steps. I got 10,000 steps. I'd be like, oh, it was 9,000 today. And I'd be upset and want to go do more the next day because uh, it was an environment, right? Um, when we can be, when we can begin to gamify this, when we can begin to build a community around which players are more competitive, they self-educate because they want to find the curve that's going to put them to the higher pedestal quicker. So when we start to look at, uh, you know, the Fitbit example, uh, if I gave a Fitbit to our guys in here and said, hey, you know, Fitbit's going to measure your your let's use daily strain as a discussion, right? You're going to daily strain for the day, and we're going to try to also measure your recovery. Uh, then, you know, our guys in here are going to work to find new ways to get more sleep, eat better. Uh, they're going to try to recover better and they're going to try to push harder. Um, mm -hmm. they, if they can see each other's scores, they, they basically argue with each other all the time. It's just bickering constantly, but it's good <laughs> bickering, right? <laughs> so, um, I think the same thing applies to this space and that's something we're really working on trying to, to, to put together, uh, creating scoring systems. Uh, to deliver really good content, there are some guys uh, that they want the deep content. They want the deep discussion. But then there's other guys that are just athletes and they love competing. And if you mm -hmm. give them something to compete for, they'll fight for it. So you have to kind of have two realms, uh, both with kind of an end goal or the end prize in mind. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I agree. And I, I've heard a phrase recently people say relative to the, the what's going on now, the pandemic, that a, a measure, when a measure becomes a target, it's no longer a good measure. But I don't think, and that's true if you want to just capture what's going on without influencing it, but you right. want to influence it, right? You want learning and adaptation, right? So I don't think that statement applies to this situation. But back to my other question, Mike. So do you envision a time when you can like plot like joints against each other, like uh, sometimes we call it state space in my in motor yeah. learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, part of that comes down to education, right? And you know, one of Casey's athletes that is actually working very closely with pro play is is Nate Pearson, who's a prospect mm -hmm. with the Toronto Blue Jays, and you know, really hard thrower. But mm -hmm. part of this is it's very exciting. Um, you know, it's very exciting to create a biomechanics lab that's in your pocket. All of that is exciting. But if you come up with data that's not actionable and it's not interpretable by the athlete, it's really quite useless. And Nate's big for helping us with that, right? If you know, I'll come up with an idea, bounce it off him, and if it totally goes whoosh, you know, that's not really something that we can go with, or we need to put some clarity around it. And you know, Casey has been really helpful with that as well because we show these metrics, we show horizontal abduction, and it's like, does this matter? You know, is this something that you actually need? And, you know, how do we create an efficiency score? How do we create a balance score? How do we create a timing score? All these things. Um, it really comes back to what, you know, the goal you're trying to create with your throwing motion. And, you know, Casey has an interesting story of an athlete recently who's coming back from an injury, and he's like, I really want to get my, my, my biomechanics assessed. I really want to. And Casey's <laughs> like, no, you're not seeing that data because it's just not the time for it in that process. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's important to get the input of the person who's consuming the metric in the metric design, I think. Um, but you're totally right in that sense, right? Like one of the hesitancies that we've had in creating like an overall, this is how good your mechanics are score mm -hmm. is that I think it's something that, you know, as somebody ages, their mechanics might change. And it doesn't mean that they're getting worse. It means they're adapting to their body and their body as it gets stronger or it becomes less flexible or, you know, starts to feel the impact of years of doing a motion that is not inherently good on your body, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, what good mechanics are change over time. And, you know, I think it's more about coming up with metrics around consistency, around balance, um, you know, and, and, and getting into that, that space a little bit more. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And, and not, well, not like that made me think of something in, in sports psychology. Some, one of the things we obsess over sometimes is getting athletes focusing too much on their own body. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, that's a theory about why people fail under pressure. We try to use external cues instead of internal. Casey does this, does this any have any tendency to get people to do that when you give too much biomechanics feedback? Do you worry, do you worry about that at all? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And we try to structure our schedule accordingly. So I'll give them, I'll allot them days where I said, look, you can think I'm okay with it. You know, we want to get to a wall. We want to find different drills, different patterns. These guys want to explore what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and, and one of the beauties of workload management is, you know, you have a set value for the day so getting to that value depending on how we you know how they choose to get there really doesn't matter as much to me as long as they get to that value so we'll have guys throwing short boxes or you know short uh you know pitching outings on a rap soto or other technology where they're spinning breaking balls and things like that but when it comes to tuesdays and saturdays which is when i label their competition days um, I try to incentivize them again with, you know, that gamification to say, Hey, listen, you're pairing off against another guy. Our goal today is you're going to out throw him. Um, whether it be velocity or command or, you know, sequences through hitters, we're trying to create, uh, different types of training environments for them off the mound. Um, so that they have different visuals or different thought processes and, and they're competing with different goals. Um, and then we basically extrapolate that over the, the span of the off season and drop them into season with as much of a game like environment in the facility as possible. Um, so they can jump into a game and feel like they haven't skipped the beat. They're just moving in and doing exactly what they've been executing for four or five months. Yeah, no, that sounds really good. Good way to do it. I think you're right. Using it at certain times and focusing on different things. And, um, yeah, I think, and does it, do you think it gives better, uh, better awareness? Do they have better awareness of their body position when they use this kind of kind of technology? 
oftentimes, and this is why, you know, going to uh, how we structure off season, oftentimes when they come in, we can give them that biomechanics assessment early um, in the off season and say, Hey, listen, when we're throwing low intensity, low volume, um, or we're you're moving volume up, but maintaining low intensity, try to give them the ability to explore and, and try to create awareness uh, early to certain movements. Because what we find is a lot of times when guys go hundred percent, they hit the mound and they're ready to actually compete. Um, we have better pattern that over time uh, and given the ability to actually understand that move. They'll get frustrated uh, if you try to do it bullpen to bullpen uh, where they're competing, because when you put them in a competitive environment, if it doesn't come out with the result, the desired result, they're going to go back to what they've done. Um, and they're going to abandon the process of trying to actually develop themselves, to get better, so to speak. So uh, if we're targeting a specific uh, assessed metric that we're trying to improve, we set that goal early. We try to get them through that when the throwing is maybe less competitive. And then we try to build it into the competitive time frame so that they can just, you know, more or less not think about it when they hit the mountain and are ready to go. Exactly what you were saying, Rob, right? You don't know better than your CNS. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And, you know, one of the things Casey was saying there is that, you know, what you're doing in the weight room, what you're doing away from the mound is probably a better predictor of what you'll do on the mound than a cue about your mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, I think the, the misconception that everybody has about all these different technology in baseball is that they all live on an island of each other, right? Like a high spin rate fastball is the end all be all. Well, no, it, it's, it, it is if you're working off of this other pitch or, mm -hmm. you know, it's delivered in this sequence. And I think the same thing goes for, for biomechanics, right? It's your, kin, your mechanics are good. However, if you've got perfect mechanics and, you know, we'll call them quote unquote perfect mechanics, but you can't crack 80, you know, chances are you're not playing at a division one or, or a higher level, right? So all of these things kind of work together. And I think what we're seeing a lot in the industry now is just, people are really hungry to try and tie everything together. And that's really where I think the, the biggest competitive advantage is to look at metrics from different devices, different technologies, uh, different outcomes or different inputs and be able to tie them together and connect those dots. And that's really where the exciting um, applications are moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I really agree. There's no one magic pill <laughs> right, no. for, for this. It's it's just information. And uh, I think the key difference I've seen is people using it like Casey's doing for development, right? Mm. So it's not just a screening tool where you're going to go, no. I'm going to draft this guy if he has this. You're using it as a tool for develop the athletes you already have, <laughs> yeah. which is a really nice changeover, <laughs> such a focus on talent ID and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Mike, how, you mentioned your fatigue units. So how have you, are you kind of putting this into your, I know, I think I have a basic, I remember kind of like with like a relief pitcher, one of the big things in your fatigue units is how often they're used, how many days rests. Um, mm -hmm. So can you, so kind of most of like a time quantity base, but can you kind of start to tweak that by looking, you know, actually models of, of how the mechanics change in that time period and things like that? Yeah. The, and that's, I think, that's kind of where I want to go with this and probably the thing that I'm most the, the most excited about as we take this to market and, you know, we, you know, work with Modus and we work with other companies to, to get some of this information is almost the idea that you could say, you know, if you want to get to a chronic workload level of this at this velocity, you know, here's what the optimal mechanics look like for you or based on your mechanics, here's the workload that you could be able to tolerate at the, this velocity level. And I think it starts to get kind of melded into that, that group there. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have anything right now on, uh, on that front, but really like after, you know, Richard's thesis and, and some of the work that we're doing now and, and the continued work that we're going to be doing with pitch AI and, and our, our research team here with Casey and, and Kobe close and, and our Brock, guys, you know, I think we can start to get to those answers, which is like super, super exciting to figure out the mechanical component of, uh, of fatigue units, which, you know, kind of closes the loop. There's our ergonomics based model on, on, on pitching. And, you know, I always joke about when anytime somebody's read fatigue units, I kind of trick them into reading my PhD thesis, which is <laughs> <laughs> considered punishment in some countries. <laughs> yeah, mine would be definitely. Um, <laughs> Um, so Casey, do you think this is like, I, obviously this is your, the way to go to, so obviously this arm injury 
problem in pitcher. You know, there's a whole book about it. If you want to, <laughs> Jeff Fasson's book, The Arm, you know, mm -hmm. about arm injuries and in pitchers is an epidemic. I don't know if it's gotten any better recently, but um, do you think this is the way forward, kind of um, quantum managing workload in an informative way, tweaking biomechanics and, and things like that? You, is that kind of the way forward, you think, for this? Yeah, we hope so. Yeah. Um, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think um, there's more and more evidence coming out on uh, what we believe right now through the different technologies that we've been able to, you know, have great groups build out over the last five, you know, 10 years. The technology is giving us an insight now uh, to be able to see uh, more consistently, uh, you know, with less time, it, it's shortening the feedback loop for the athlete. Um, mm -hmm. And there's every bullpen thrown in our facility. I mean, we're collecting, I think, 12 to 15 data points on ball flight. Uh, we have a high-speed camera rolling. We're getting biomechanics feedback from open side, from pitch AI. And, you know, we have a, a modus sleeve that's collecting uh, data every pitch or every throw. It's like, man, you know, years and, you know, 10 years ago, that would have been, you know, a dream. It would have been crazy for people to think about. And the amount of time it would have take to actually run that data would have, would have been absurd. It wouldn't have done much good for the athlete. Um, I think the, the big issue is we're running into an educational issue um, with, you know, coaches and athletes where you're getting so much right now from so many very smart people that, uh, understanding, you know, trying to stay up to date on what's the latest metric to come out and, and understanding how to utilize it to develop your model. Uh, you know, it, it takes an, it's a night and day thing. I don't, I don't sleep much. Um, you know, I, I'm reading a lot, <laughs> yeah. constantly trying to talk to my network and trying to see what's out there. But, um, you know, you want to do what's right for your athlete. You want to do what's best for them. And, and I think, you know, building, uh, there's gonna be a lot of other facilities like ours out there that are taking all of this in and trying to build their own models of their own development style. Um, and, you know, trying to just help athletes get better. It's really what it all comes mm -hmm. down to, right? It, it's not about, uh, it's not about us or, or, you know, all the flashing lights when a guy throws, it looks cool. But uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if it's not doing us any good um, and we're not reevaluating our, our, you know, our systems on a day in a day out basis, then we're just not getting better. And, and the athletes are going to eventually see that and go somewhere else. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really more realistic approach than, you know, the idea we have to force kids not to throw, like telling them mm -hmm. if I, I want to be a baseball, my dream is to be a baseball pitcher. Well, you can't play baseball in the summer. You know, <laughs> you can't yeah. play. Well, you can't play all year round. You got to do another sport. You can't go to these showcases. You know, maybe that's better, but it's unrealistic. And then just to have hard caps of not throwing so much without any, you know, basis for it. I think mm -hmm. this is much more realistic way you, you have to accept they want to do as much as they can and they're going to mm -hmm. right? and, and it, so you have to do it in a, a safe way yeah, yeah so i think that's a really a, a good approach um, so mike we're kind of wrapping up here mike so where does kind of this stand if people are interested in this and and want to learn more and you know potentially use it and when it when it's available Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so our website is ProPlayAI.com. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be regularly posting updates there on on some of the the research we're doing to develop the tool. Um, you know, follow myself uh, at Dr. Mike Son and follow Casey on Twitter. We'll be releasing all of the the exciting research that we're putting together, and um, we're expecting the app should be available in July. So that's when we'll start rolling out uh, invites to the to the product. Um, get people capturing mechanics uh, directly on their phones all all across North America. Pretty exciting. Yeah, that sounds great to me. <laughs> like more data, the better. Yeah, <laughs> of so, course. Yeah. So, uh, well, thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate this. A lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot for having us, Rob. Appreciate it, Rob. And this live. Mm -hmm.